Okay, then let us summarize what we did so far for the standard model. We have discussed the standard model at three level and uh, discussed the Lagrangian for first for one generation and then also for three generations. The Lagrangian depends obviously on quite a large number of parameters and fields and we did two parametrizations. The first one, the original one in terms of the symmetric fields and parameters and then we went to a kind of physical parametrization in terms of fields like the photon Z, W plus minus field and the corresponding more physical parameters. And let us just summarize this and then also give an overview of the Feynman rules. So originally we have the two gauge couplings GW, GY and we have two Higgs potential parameters mu square and lambda. And then we can reparameterize those four parameters which define the electroweak and uh, the electroweak symmetry breaking sector in a variety of ways. First of all we can introduce the electric charge E and the weak mixing angle theta and sine theta. That is the first thing that we did. And in the Higgs potential, we can actually introduce yet another parameter called V, which uh, might be chosen as the three level vacuum expectation value, but which also might be chosen in a more general way. So we introduce a fifth parameter which cannot change the physics, but which only changes the way we parameterize our fields. And then we have, in addition, still mu square and lambda. And if we take those five parameters, then there is again a variety of ways how we can uh, equivalently rewrite them. So from the Higgs potential, we can keep this V and we can calculate the Higgs boson mass and uh, the tadpole parameter, or we can uh, eliminate uh, V in favor of the W boson mass and keep the Higgs mass and the tadpole parameter or we can eliminate the weak mixing angle in terms of the Z boson mass and then we have here actually a parametrization like this where we parameterize the standard model in terms of one gauge coupling and three masses for the bosons W, Z and Higgs and one fifth parameter, the tadpole parameter, which is zero if we are in the correct um, vacuum expectation value. So what is the relationship between these parametrizations? So this is the original one and the last one is the most obviously physical one. So in one direction, the relationship can be written like this. Electric charge is given by that combination of the original gauge couplings, uh, the weak mixing angle or tangent of the weak mixing angle is given by this ratio. Um, the three level vacuum expectation value, let me also give that uh, quickly, is given by mu square over lambda. And uh, so, wait a minute. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, so we can invert this to write GW and GY as E divided by either sine theta or cosine theta and of course we can also invert uh, the other relations in an obvious way. And let me now give you the final relationships.
by the way. Uh, I forgot the section number. This is section 2.4. So the final relationships are then E is given uh, once again by this. MW is given by GW times V divided by 2. MZ is given by MW times basically divided by cosine of the weak mixing angle, which in terms of the original parameters can be written like this. And the Higgs mass square is given by minus mu square plus 3 lambda v square. And the TET pole is given by mu square v minus lambda v cube. That is then one direction for the um, relationship going from the original four parameters plus the unphysical v to the final most physical uh, five parameters. And in the exercise we discussed that there are various different options for the choice of the Higgs mass square parameter. There is uh, clearly one value for the physical Higgs mass at tree level, but uh, the mass parameter mh square can be defined in various reasonable ways because one can add or subtract uh, tet pole contributions which are anyway zero in the true vacuum. And this is the version uh, which was also proposed in the exercise by one of you, which um, is just the prefactor of the quadratic Higgs mass term in the potential, irrespectively of what is the value of the tet pole parameter. So that does not necessarily correspond to the true um, three level Higgs mass, but it's the Higgs mass parameter. Then we can also add a relationship for the Yukawa's and fermion masses. Which is of course fermion mass mf is given by yf times v divided by square root of 2. And let me just say uh, as a side note, in this parametrization, the Higgs potential uh, as a function of the Higgs field V of I uh, is given as follows, just to make that point once again, minus T times H plus MH square times uh, over 2 times H square minus T times the Goldstone boson mass square, so 1 half G zero square plus g plus absolute value square. So uh, if t is non-zero, then there is something like a would-be mass term for those Goldstone bosons. And uh, then everything else is trilinear and quartic terms. So let me just say plus lambda times v h cube plus h to the 4 over 4 plus uh, many other terms involving the Goldstone bosons. Uh, but here you see what I said before, namely the mh square parameter is really the coefficient of h square in the potential. So then uh, that is a relationship in one direction. Let us also write down the inverse relationship. which is GW and Y are given by E divided by SW or CW. We are now, CW is equal to square root of 1 minus SW square is defined as the ratio of MW over MZ. So the inverse relationship must uh, start from only those five parameters uh, which contain MW and MZ, and from the ratio MW and MZ, we can construct this version of the weak mixing angle, and then uh, we can obtain our uh, original gauge couplings in this way. 
the uh, shift V, this would be vacuum expectation value, is given by 2MW times the electric charge, uh, sorry, times uh, SW divided by the electric charge. The mu square parameter is given by MH square over 2 plus 3 over 2 times TET pole divided by V. And here, this V could be also eliminated by using the previous formula. And the original lambda parameter is given by MH square times V divided by uh, plus TET pole divided by 2 V cubed. And of course, for the fermions, we would have Yf is equal to Mf uh, times square root of 2 divided by V. Then the three level vacuum is of course given by setting this TET pole parameter to zero. And only then, in this case, all these quantities uh, written on the left and on the top correspond to their obvious physical meaning. Only if that is the case, then uh, mh square, mz, and mw correspond to the true masses of those particles. But um, in general computations, uh, we should keep the TET pole arbitrary or as a free parameter. So because that is necessary to do the renormalization procedure. OK. Then. Uh, that is our summary of the parametrizations of the standard model. And next I would give you uh, some highlights of the Feynman rules, uh, which are of course in complete form collected in uh, the literature. And it would be way too much work to write down all Feynman rules and it also becomes obviously repetitive. But uh, let me give you some Feynman rule highlights. And they are now given for TED pole equal to zero. So we have, first of all, the propagator Feynman rules, which are non-trivial. So let's say we have here some vector boson V with Lorentz index mu nu and momentum Q flowing in this direction. Then, uh, because of our xi gauge, our vector boson propagators are quite complicated. And uh, they are as follows, minus i divided by Q square minus the corresponding uh, vector boson mass parameter squared. And then the prefactor is first of all g mu nu. And then uh, because of gauge fixing, there is minus 1 minus xi v times q mu q nu divided by q square minus xi v uh, mv square. And here, these gauge fixing parameters zeta are set equal to psi for each gauge boson. And then you see that here there is a second pole emerging for the gauge boson propagators. And that second pole is located at a different mass, namely at this unphysical mass uh, psi times m square. It's gauge dependent. And uh, in the numerator, we have 1 minus xi, so that uh, term here vanishes for xi equal 1. 
Then we have Goldstone boson propagators, which are unphysical. Goldstone either zero or plus minus for momentum uh, P flowing. That is then I divided by P square minus theta or xi V times mv square. So we see because of gauge fixing the Goldstone bosons become massive and their masses are equal to these unphysical uh, additional poles from the vector bosons. Then there are ghosts. For the Popov ghosts, C, zero or plus minus propagators, they have the same value. I divided by P square minus MV xi V times MV square. So again, the poles of the ghosts are located at the same position. And in the quantum field theory two lecture, we have discussed the fundamental reason for this because the slavnov taylor identity guarantees exactly that equality between the locations of the pole of the longitudinal vector bosons, the Woodby Goldstone bosons and the Fadiev Popov ghosts. And all the other propagators are as usual. Then uh, let me give some important interactions. There are the interactions between gauge bosons and the fermions. So here photon Z or W and here some fermions and they are as um, given in section one where we specify them completely. Then there are some non-abelian um, interactions where three gauge bosons interact directly in a vertex and that is possible because we have a non-abelian gauge theory and here in particular there are only those kinds of vertices where either a photon or a Z interacts with two W bosons and that is not Z, uh, zero and let me just give you the non-vanishing uh, terms so then you have here also of quartic uh, interaction with two W bosons and at the other lines you can have any combination of photon Z and W which uh, corresponds to charge conservation overall and then those vertices are non-zero and correspond to self interactions between gauge bosons. Then we have also interactions between gauge bosons and uh, the Higgs. And these are like the interactions with fermions coming just from the covariant derivative terms in the uh, Lagrangian, so they are not special at all. What is special a little bit is that uh, there must always be an interaction between one physical Higgs and one of the Goldstone bosons because uh, we are gauge transformations, the Higgs transforms into Goldstone bosons and therefore we can only have interactions where let's say a Higgs appears and on the other vertex a Goldstone boson appears. And depending on the charges it can be charged or neutral. So this is also not zero and the Feynman rules are proportional to E or E over SW or E over SW CW depending on the case. And for scalars there is the special thing that the covariant derivative term because it's d mu phi square also generates quartic interactions with uh, two scalars Higgs or Goldstone and two gauge bosons and those interactions would be proportional to E square over some appropriate denominator. So uh, all of what you see here follows uh, completely directly from the covariant derivatives in the Lagrangian and uh, is completely governed by gauge invariance. 
Now we come for the first time to something which is not completely generic, but which depends on the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Namely, because of spontaneous symmetry breaking, there are also those kinds of vertices where one Higgs couples to two gauge bosons. And that thing is proportional to the Higgs vacuum expectation value, so it can appear. And uh, these interactions uh, are proportional to the mass of the respective vector bosons. So here you would have, let's say, uh, W or Z, W or Z, and uh, the concrete Feynman rules are given by I, E, M, W over S, W or I, E, M, Z divided by S, W, C, W. And uh, the important thing that is well known, of course, is that these Feynman rules are proportional to the masses of the respective particles. And the same is also true for the Higgs boson interactions with fermions. There it's more obvious because this is, of course, a Yukawa coupling. And uh, that can, however, be eliminated in favor of the masses. And then this is fermion mass times E divided by square root of 2 MW SW. And so again, this is proportional to the mass of the respective fermion. So uh, the couplings with a single Higgs to anything is proportional to the respective mass. And then from the Higgs potential evaluation, we have uh, not only the Higgs mass term and the tadpole, but we also have interactions between different uh, scalars. So we have self-interactions of the physical Higgs, but we have also many, many interactions of the physical and unphysical Goldstone bosons. They are all governed by the self-interaction coupling lambda, which can be expressed in a complicated way in terms of the fundamental physical parameters of the theory. So in particular, we can read off uh, the triple Higgs interaction as one example, most important example. So that is proportional to lambda times V. And uh, you can write this then as minus 3 times I E M H square divided by 2 M W S W. Okay. And uh, then th uh, here, this uh, triple Higgs self-interaction, so this proportionality to a mass in the case of the Higgs self-interaction is a little bit different. Uh, here, the coupling of three Higgses is proportional to Higgs mass square. That comes out of the calculation. And of course, there are many more interactions, but this is the most important kinds of interactions, and you can easily understand that for each kind there are many more examples. And, uh, but I think uh, you are able to work out all these Feynman rules from the information given here, and the final results for the Feynman rules are of course tabulated, also implemented in computer programs. So this ends our three-level discussion of the standard model, and now we can come to um, higher orders. discuss the following. Let us discuss the on-shell renormalization of the electroweak standard model. And let me start with a few remarks. In general, there are two big important general renormalization schemes which can be uh, applied in practice. One scheme which is very frequently used is the so-called MS bar scheme, minimal subtraction. And the other scheme which is very frequently used in practice is the on-shell scheme. 
And both schemes are valuable in models like QED and in the standard model. Both, both have pros and cons. And we will discuss a little bit uh, the relative pros and cons later, but let me first say both are applicable. In QED and the electroweak standard model. And they can be applied in a pure form. Uh, in particular, the on shell scheme is uh, essentially perfect, perfectly applicable. And uh, to contrast this in models which are not the standard model or QED, this is not always the case in models uh, beyond the SM. Uh, there are uh, often mixed schemes necessary. They have almost inevitably some drawbacks and therefore there is very often in the literature a big debate and discussion what renormalization scheme one should choose because each scheme that you can choose has some disadvantages and then you can endlessly debate what you should do because ultimately uh, there is no optimal choice. However, that is the case in the standard model. There is an optimal choice. In fact, there are two optimal choices which basically uh, contain practically uh, only advantages. And uh, so let me say, even in the on-shell scheme, there are uh, different detailed options. Uh, related, for example, to a field renormalization and to the uh, treatment of these tadpoles. And also, uh, you can debate endlessly about this. However, uh, also that debate in the standard model is not particularly uh, important and deep because ultimately uh, there are no really bad choices in the standard model. However, uh, the counterpart of those debates in models beyond the standard model are much more complicated uh, because you then encounter all these drawbacks. So why am I saying this? I am saying this in order to explain that despite uh, the fact that there are many different so-called renormalization schemes which are important and which are discussed in the literature, I believe that for this lecture it is best to start by discussing precisely one scheme and only one scheme and uh, discuss that in great detail and with a lot of care such that you understand really well how this single scheme works and then you have a basis for understanding later on all possible alternatives. But I will not at every point in the derivations point you towards all the different possible alternative schemes because that would convolute the discussion and make it really intransparent. Therefore, uh, what we will do here is uh, give a detailed account of one such uh, basically optimal uh, scheme for the standard model. And at the end, or maybe in exercises and in just a few subtle remarks, you might uh, become aware of alternatives. So uh, let me give you some literature. So there are basically three papers which define everything that we do. And uh, the first paper is from Aoki et al. from 1980. This was a very long 100 page or so uh, paper, basically a review on uh, the renormalization of the standard model, 
where they discussed uh, both the techniques, the necessary uh, proofs, and uh, the practical application. Similarly, uh, there are a variety of works by Ansgar Denner, for example, his habilitation, but also uh, the book by uh, Denner, Böhm Jos, which uh, contains an extended version of what he wrote in his habilitation. Um, and also a more recent review by uh, Denner and Dittmeier, which is a physics report from around 2021. And in all these three references, they uh, explain basically the same renormalization scheme as uh, Aoki et al but uh, in a slightly modernized and uh, also extremely systematic form. And the third uh, reference would be by Böhm Hollig Spiesberger, a famous paper from 86, where they also discussed in great detail the renormalization of the electroweak standard model and they used a slightly different approach to uh, the previous two kinds of papers. And so th that corresponds to one of those details uh, where you have some different options regarding the field renormalization. Then, when we uh, will now start discussing the renormalization, I will not anymore um, talk about proofs and the validity of the renormalization approach because for that we completely rely on what we have done in other lectures where we basically completely went through all the ingredients necessary to prove the existence of a renormalized gauge theory and uh, the necessity um, to discuss Slavnov Taylor identities and uh, the discussion how the Slavnov Taylor identities govern the structure of counter terms. So we will completely apply those results. So the following approaches are uh, correct because of the general theorems and their proofs see the quantum field theory 2 lecture in particular. And uh, in particular, the outcome is that a slavnov taylor identity, which describes BRST and gauge invariance on the quantum level, is required. And it can be proven to be, ho uh, to be valid at all orders. And once it is valid, it uh, governs the structure of the required and necessary counter terms. required and sufficient, I should say. Okay, and here uh, the structure is such that uh, it can be generated from this typical renormalization transformation of fields and parameters. And that will be our starting point. We will use that and then uh, discuss here at length the practical implementation of how you do renormalization in the standard model. Any preliminary questions before we start on this? Is it clear what we need to do? Okay, then let's do it. Uh, actually, maybe in order to make it really super clear what we need to do, I wanted to interject an example uh, namely, I want to do first QED, even though it might be uh, a bit boring, but I hope not, uh, because at least for all of you sitting here, uh, we in our group have not yet discussed the renormalization of QED in uh, to full extent, and so let me do that. And then afterwards, the standard model will be done, uh, basically following that example.
As you will see, QED really is a role model for the renormalization of the electroweak standard model. It uh, is also a gauge theory with a massless photon and uh, couplings to fermions where we need renormalization and where the slavnov taylor and Watt identity plays an important role via the, uh, or within the renormalization procedure. And uh, let us discuss exactly the steps needed for QED and then all the steps will have to be repeated for the electroweak standard model. The Lagrangian of QED at a classical level, CL, is the following minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu plus psi bar i d slash minus m psi uh, with a covariant derivative and then we have a gauge fixing and ghost term psi over 2 b square plus b da and uh, if we want we can add a ghost term c bar minus C bar d'Alembert C. And uh, that gauge fixing term might be a little bit unfamiliar to some of you who are not in the quantum field theory 2 lecture, but the B field is an auxiliary field. And if we use the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion for B, then they do not involve derivatives and they are simply B is equal to minus one over psi d mu a mu. The ghost and, and anti-ghost can be neglected because it is non-interacting. Therefore, this is just a free uh, part of a free ghost field which interacts with nothing. Therefore, we can drop it from the Lagrangian and then this becomes simply equal to minus one over two xi d mu a mu square, which is the usual xi dependent gauge fixing term for QED. But for the slavnov taylor identity discussions, it is useful to keep in mind the full structure, including everything, because then deriving some identities will be simpler. The covariant derivative is the normal derivative plus i e q times a mu. And everything else is clear. I think I do not need to say anything more. We assume now dimensional regularization and we assume the validity of all uh, relevant slavnov taylor and Watt identities. And we assume that in D dimensions. So, then, as I told you in some previous lecture, uh, renormalization in practice can be split into five steps. If you want to be, let's say, uh, pedagogical in practice, of course, you can mix the steps. But uh, for today, again, let me try to keep to that five-step procedure. Then the first step would be to do a renormalization transformation. That provides us with a counterterm Lagrangian LCT for counterterms. Then we can evaluate the counterterms and uh, evaluate, for example, renormalized green functions. Which uh, depend on counterterm Feynman rules. Then third, we define a renormalization scheme. Which uh, really fully defines the values of all the counterterms um, according to that scheme and which then gives some prescription for the remaining finite parts of all the green functions. After specifying this renormalization scheme, it needs to be evaluated. We have to evaluate the counter terms or the so-called renormalization constants.
And once we have done that, in principle, the renormalization formalism is completed and we have building blocks which are complete in order to do practical calculations. So then the fifth step consists of all your favorite applications and computations of uh, your model. Let's say then what remains is to compute observables. So, okay, so this is the five step procedure and here obviously we will uh, deal with the first four steps uh, and the application is then left to the reader. But, uh, so let us begin. Renormalization, transformation, and counter terms in QED. The procedure is now simply as follows. We take our classical Lagrangian, which you see here, and all quantities in it are replaced by so called bare quantities and then in this way we obtain what is called a bare Lagrangian. And what are those bare quantities and uh, how are they defined? So they are then bare quantities E bare, M bare, Xi bare for the parameters, then A mu bare Psi bear for the fields. And then those are written as follows. So the gauge coupling E bear is written as E plus delta E, where this is now called a renormalized quantity. This is the renormalized quantity. And this delta quantity is called renormalization constant. Where the word constant is misleading because uh, that is really a function of E, which can be perturbatively evaluated in terms of a power series, and it also is it depending on the regularization. In dimensional regularization, there is our dimensionality, d equal four minus two epsilon, and so this would depend on that epsilon regularization parameter. And typically, those renormalization constants are divergent, which means that they contain one over epsilon terms. So this is the bare uh, uh, charge, and then there is also the bare mass. m bare is equal to m plus delta m with the same meaning. Xi bear is given by z xi times xi, where z xi is given as one plus delta z xi, and then again, uh, this is a renormalization constant, which has the same property as delta e and delta m. And for the fields, we write a mu bear is given as square root of ZA times A mu, and again, ZA is given as one plus delta ZA. And for the electron field, Psi bear is given as square root of Z times Psi, where Z is given as one plus delta Z. And then we have here our list of bare quantities renormalized quantities and renormalization constants. Now, there is one uh, non-trivial remark here. 
which comes from the fact that QED is a gauge theory, and uh, in a gauge theory where we have Ward and Slavnov Taylor identities, there are certain non trivial relationships between the renormalized uh, uh, quantities and the renormalization constants. And so, in this case, let us, as I said before, use the results from our quantum field theory 2 lecture, where we said the following. So oh, we didn't say this, but uh, let us first observe that if we take uh, the derivative of the classical action, gamma classical is the integral over the classical Lagrangian. Let us take the functional derivative of that with respect to B. B is a non-physical field, but anyway, if we take this functional derivative, we get psi times B plus d mu a mu. And uh, the point of this expression is it is linear, linear in the quantum fields of the theory. There are no products of fields. And if you con this is a classical expression, if you convert this expression to a quantum theory expression, then that would be replaced by an expectation value, but the expectation value of the field becomes uh, the expectation value of the field. So there is nothing non-trivial going on. Something non-trivial would go on if there were products, because products of expectation values behave non-trivially. Uh, uh, expectation values of products are not the same as products of expectation values. Um, and so therefore, in this case, uh, we proved that then, if that is linear, uh, it immediately translates to an all-order expression where uh, the effective action has the same functional derivative as the classical action. So that simply follows from the linearity. And therefore, we know immediately at all orders how uh, does our B field enter in the full theory. And that tells us something about the renormalization of uh, everything that appears here. Namely, A mu has to renormalize in the same way as B and Xi. And uh, therefore, the, all these terms that stand here do not renormalize at all. They do not get quantum corrections. And for this reason, we know that B must have the opposite renormalization as A mu, and Xi must have the opposite renormalization as B square. And therefore, we know in the end that the renormalization of Xi set xi must be the same as set a at all orders. So we have already one simplification. The gauge parameter does uh, not have an independent renormalization. And the simple statement is that the gauge fixing term L fix does not renormalize. So that is the simple statement that you can memorize. The gauge fixing term doesn't renormalize. And so uh, whenever we apply the renormalization transformation later, this term here will never change. And it will never receive z factors and renormalization constants. OK, so this is a simplification uh, to our general renormalization prescription. Then once we have that, we can obtain counter terms. Counter terms are obtained by applying our renormalization transformation, where we first replace our classical Lagrangian by that recipe by a bare Lagrangian. And then we write our bare Lagrangian again as the original classical Lagrangian plus a remainder which then by definition is the counterterm Lagrangian. So in this classical Lagrangian, there appear only renormalized quantities. And here, uh, every term in this counterterm Lagrangian contains some renormalization constant. So, and our task is then to work this out, to really obtain 
the precise form of the Bayer Lagrangian and of the counterterm Lagrangian. And let us do that. So the Bayer Lagrangian. The Bayer Lagrangian is this very same expression uh, where everywhere there stands an in index Bayer at all quantities. So that is not necessary to be written down, but let us write down the next step where we replace in that uh, expression over there the bare quantities by the right hand sides of that replacement rule. So for example, so there is the f mu nu, f mu nu term times minus one over four. Okay, and uh, in the bare Lagrangian, we could write minus one over four times f bare mu nu times f bare mu nu, but f bare mu nu is the same as uh, square root of z a times f mu nu, and therefore we get here a prefactor z a, which is the same as one plus delta z a, right? Is that clear? So this is the first term in our bare Lagrangian. Then uh, the original classical Lagrangian contains this term, psi bar i d slash psi. And now we unfortunately need to expand the Lagrangian a little bit and we have to uh, really expand the covariant derivative and just look once at the term with the ordinary derivative. So in the bare Lagrangian there would be now this term psi bare bar times psi bare. Psi bear is a square root of z times the original psi, so that gets a prefactor z, or in other words, it gets a prefactor 1 plus delta z. Okay. Then the Lagrangian contains the term minus m times uh, psi bar psi. What happens to that term? we would get m bear times psi bear times psi bear. So we get a prefactor z times m plus delta m. And so we can write this as uh, m plus delta m times one plus delta z times psi bar psi. So we get here products of renormalization constants. Then there is uh, the term with the interaction, psi bar uh, minus E Q A slash psi. And uh, so what happens to this term? This is the most complicated. So it, if you replace everything by pair and then plug in the replacement rule, then you get first of all a factor one plus delta z from the two fermions you also get the term square root of one plus delta z a from the photon, and you get the term times uh, one plus delta e over e from the charge renormalization, right? So this is what you get. And finally, from the gauge fixing term, after having said that the gauge fixing doesn't renormalize, we have uh, all the information and we can simply write down uh, that eliminated form of the gauge fixing. And so let's do that, minus one over two psi times d mu a mu square. And here you see the impact of that previous statement. This last line here does not contain any renormalization constants because they cancel in the gauge fixing term. This is what is meant by saying the gauge fixing doesn't renormalize. That is our bare Lagrangian, which is already expressed in terms of renormalized quantities and renormalization constants. And so you see now that this bare Lagrangian can be written like a sum of uh, terms without the renormalization constants plus the rest. And uh, so let us do that. So then we obtain what is called the counterterm Lagrangian, which is simply the part where we remove uh, the one without renormalization constants. Okay. 
And then, for example, from the first line, what do we get? In the first line, the term with the 1 goes into the classical Lagrangian, and the term with the delta ZA goes into the counter term Lagrangian. Then in the second line, uh, again, the term with the 1 goes into the classical part. The delta Z term goes into the counter term Lagrangian. And in the third line, we obtain here minus. Now what do we obtain in the third line? There, because of the product, it is more complicated. So the term with M times 1 uh, goes into the classical part, and then we get M times delta Z plus delta M plus delta Z times delta M times psi bar psi. And in the next part here, plus what do we get here in this? Let us evaluate it at linear order. Then we get delta Z plus 1 half delta Z A plus delta E over E plus dot 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 and the dot 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 terms, they co uh, contain products of delta Z times psi bar minus E Q A slash psi. And uh, then from the gauge fixing, there is nothing in the counter term Lagrangian because uh, this term is, um, contain, is fully renormalized and therefore it goes into the classical part and the counter term Lagrangian contains no um, term involving the gauge fixing. So and uh, at one loop order, um, all the delta zi are uh, order one loop, and so we can neglect products. So therefore, at the one loop level, here uh, we would only get from this term, for example, m times delta z plus delta m. This is then a strict one loop expression, and uh, from that we get simply this combination delta z plus one half delta z a plus delta e over e, uh, and no dot 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 terms. This is then exact at the one loop level. Okay, so in this way you obtain a counter term Lagrangian from the classical Lagrangian and your renormalization transformation. Did I say that this is step one? Maybe I should say that. Let me say this is step one. All of that is step one, the renormalization transformation. So that is done. Now go to our second step. The second step is to evaluate the counter terms and uh, evaluate how the counter terms enter into renormalized green functions. Let us do that. Step two. One loop counter term Feynman rules. So uh, the procedure is that this L counter term is regarded as a new interaction. As you remember from basic quantum field theory, 
The Lagrangian contains uh, two types of terms. Uh, some terms correspond to the free theory and give the propagator Feynman rules. Some other terms correspond to interactions and they give the vertices in the theory. So typically the bilinear terms are free and give the propagators. Now here there are some bilinear terms in that counter term Lagrangian, but they are nevertheless treated as an interaction. That is possible. And so then we, in that way, we have interactions which are manifestly of one loop order. And therefore, we get vertices which are specifically of one loop order. And that allows us to count the number of loops very transparently in our Feynman rules. That is called renormalized perturbation theory. Then uh, we have new Feynman rules, and they are marked with a cross. Cross stands for one loop Feynman rules. And uh, there is the one with a mu a nu, where a momentum q flows through that vertex. And that is now a two point vertex. And uh, this comes from the first term here in the counter term Lagrangian. Now you know that if you derive a counter term or a Feynman rule from the Lagrangian, derivatives become minus i times the inflowing momentum into the respective field. So here we have two derivatives. They are combined in a transverse manner because that is gauge invariant. And so therefore, in the end, you obtain from this the following Feynman rule, minus i times delta za times basically a transverse expression, namely, uh, plus q squared g mu nu minus q mu q nu. So it's uh, proportional to a transverse pro um, projector. And that transversality is directly connected to the gauge invariance of f mu f mu nu. So uh, interestingly, as a side comment, this counter term is purely transverse. So there is only the possibility that transverse divergences can be cancelled. If the divergence would uh, not have this momentum structure, it couldn't be cancelled by that counter term. And uh, why is it transverse? Because the gauge fixing does not renormalize. If the gauge fixing would renormalize, it would provide a longitudinal additional term here, but it doesn't renormalize, and therefore there is no longitudinal term here. And therefore, this uh, slavnov taylor identity, which uh, tells us that the gauge fixing doesn't renormalize, should at the same time hopefully guarantee that there are no divergences with a different structure. Next counterterm Feynman rule for the fermion propagator, coming from this term here in the Lagrangian and also from uh, the mass term. So this here is here, psi, psi bar and let's say a momentum p flows in the direction of the arrow. Then again, uh, id slash becomes the incoming momentum. So that becomes p slash. And then we have in total i times delta z times p slash minus m minus i delta m. So delta z times p slash comes from here, delta z times minus m comes from here, and minus delta m comes from there. So there are two renormalization constants entering this counterterm Feynman rule. So basically, the counterterm Feynman rule has a structure polynomial of first degree in p slash with arbitrary coefficients of the p slash term and the constant term. So any divergence which has such a form can be cancelled. Then third, the, and uh, finally, this counter term corresponds to an interaction of the photon and uh, e plus e minus, basically. And so the Feynman rule is the same as three level up to that prefactor. So it is minus i e q gamma mu times delta z plus one half delta z a plus delta e over e. 
This is a complete set of one-loop Feynman rules in QED. And at the two-loop level, or at even arbitrary high-loop order, how would the counterterm structure look like? It would have the same counterterm Lagrangian, only that in the prefactors of those field monomials, there would be products of renormalization constants also appearing. So the only change of the counterterm Feynman rules at higher orders is that the left-hand sides have the same structure, but on the right-hand side, for example, here there would be an additional term delta z times delta m. And here there would be many more product terms inside of the round bracket, but everything else would remain the same at arbitrarily high loop orders. So then, once we have these counterterm Feynman rules, we can um, look at their impact on interesting green functions, as uh, alluded to on, on the outline over there on the left. So what are some important green functions? Let us define simply their names and uh, analyze their structure for later calculations. So, for example, there is the photon self-energy, which is called minus i sigma mu nu of q, which is defined as the following one particle irreducible green function. So this is one particle irreducible at the one loop level without counter terms. So that is I minus I sigma, that is the photon self energy with Lorentz indices mu nu and momentum Q. That is the photon self energy. And then next we have the electron self energy I sigma of P similar where P flows uh, in the direction of the arrow and it is also one particle irreducible one loop without counter terms. And finally we have a three point function minus I E Q capital lambda mu of Q P and P prime is defined as follows, namely, again, one PI, one loop, no counter terms. This three point function, and uh, so how do we call it? Vertex correction. So we have now introduced three names for three important one-loop building blocks. And those are precisely the one-loop building blocks which are affected now by our counterterms. And so therefore, let us write this including counterterms. So after the renormalization procedure, the uh, full photon self-energy is not only the one PI one loop diagram without counter terms, but it also receives a contribution from the counter term Feynman rule here. This is now actually a one particle irreducible uh, Feynman diagram contributing to the photon self energy. That is a one particle irreducible Feynman diagram contributing to the electron self energy and that contributes to the vertex correction. And these three Feynman diagrams, as simple as they are, but these are one loop Feynman diagrams because the renormalization constants are of one loop order. And therefore the full photon self energy is now this plus the counter term and that is what I want to write down as a formula and uh, to introduce this notation with a hat. So the hat denotes now the um, one PI green function with counter term after renormalization. So minus i sigma hat mu nu of q is given by minus i sigma without hat mu nu plus the counter term Feynman rule minus i g mu nu q square minus q mu q nu times delta z a. 
similarly, the electron self-energy after renormalization, sigma hat of p, is given by i times sigma without hat of p plus i delta z p slash minus m minus i delta m. And finally, the vertex correction, we can factor out here the um, minus i eq, then we would simply have lambda mu uh, of q p p prime. Oh, I forgot to write the labels. So q flows inside, p flows inside along the direction of the arrow, and p prime flows out along the direction of the arrow. Then uh, after renormalization, lambda hat mu is the unrenormalized lambda mu with the same arguments plus the counterterm Feynman rule, which is minus gamma mu uh, plus gamma mu times delta z plus one half delta z a plus delta e over e. So this is what I meant by this step two, that we write our um, relevant green functions in a renormalized form such that we have building blocks uh, which are important and which contain in a known way and an, in an evaluated way the renormalization constants. These sort of expressions uh, can be derived once you know what the counterterm Feynman rules are and it is useful to record that. And that is what we have done. So in this sense we have now also completed our step two of the program. Any questions to this so far? I mean, we are going through this uh, maybe quite quickly, uh, maybe not super quickly, but uh, so, but uh, we want to, of course, come to the standard model where everything gets repeated in a much more uh, complicated form. Yep. So for the last um, example, Friedman function, um, we only include counter terms that are one PI, or why don't we also include, for example, the three-level coupling and then a renormalized propagate? Um, can you let me know in more detail what you are imagining? What uh, kind of Feynman diagram, maybe? Or? This? Ah, okay. This is not one particle irreducible, therefore it does not contribute to our one particle irreducible interaction. Uh, therefore we do not include it in the definition of lambda hat. So lambda hat and all these hatted quantities, they are, um, okay, I maybe, yeah, let me not write it down because it's kind of repetitive, but they are of course defined in this way, that they are the one PI, one loop expressions with counter terms. And uh, this is a one particle irreducible Feynman diagram. It's a trivial Feynman diagram, but nevertheless, it's a one particle irreducible Feynman diagram because as you know, I mean, for this Feynman rule, these lines are not part of the diagram. So therefore, there is no line that can be cut. It. A definition of one PI is that you cannot cut a line and make the diagram disconnected. So here there is no line, therefore it's one PI. But uh, that diagram would be reducible because you can cut this line and so it would contribute to physical processes uh, which you might calculate for some S matrix elements uh, which depend of course on reducible diagrams. But uh, it is sufficient to calculate and have control first over all the 1PI building blocks and once we control these building blocks we can then put them together and uh, obtain S matrix elements and uh, Feynman diagrams which are reducible. So of course uh, some of the simplest Feynman diagrams for physical processes are like these. They are not one particle irreducible and they contain in an important way a propagator in the S channel and then uh, you might have this counter term contribution uh, which is not one PI but uh, the counter term contribution plus this one loop Feynman diagram, they can be treated separately and they would be treated inside of this sigma hat discussion. And so once we know that, we have a building block which is already renormalized and then we can go on to consider such a fuller process. 
this is the idea, and that is why we are doing this in, in this way. the renormalization scheme and uh, the expression for the renormalization constants. What is a renormalization scheme? There are always these uh, three or four equivalent ways to uh, characterize what a renormalization scheme is. A renormalization scheme is the choice of the split of bare quantities into renormalized quantities and renormalization constants. That split is not unique. If the theory is finite by some choice of delta E, it remains finite if you shift around some finite parts between E and delta E. Therefore, intrinsically, the renormalization uh, structure uh, as a whole does not fix that split. You need to fix it by imposing some renormalization scheme uh, by making some choice. That choice is on the one hand equivalent to uh, requiring um, a certain choice of the finite parts of green functions, such as our sigma hat and lambda hat quantities. Because uh, if you change the split by a finite amount in delta E, then uh, obviously the sigma hat and lambda hat, they are also uh, modified by finite amounts. And so the choice of the scheme is equivalent to fixing uh, either the split or the finite parts of the renormalized green functions. If you fix the split or the finite part, then this is also equivalent to fixing the, the, actually the mathematical formula. So the mathematical dependence of uh, the functional behavior of delta E as a function of E. Or delta E, etc., as functions of E and all the other quantities. So I write it only for E and delta E, but this same discussion applies to all renormalization constants. So uh, this will be a formula, a function like E square times 1 over epsilon plus E to the 4 times uh, 1 over epsilon square, and so on. And that formula will change depending on the choice of the renormalization scheme. If you can change the formulas and if you can change the finite parts of your um, renormalized green functions, then of course the formulas for observables will also change. The formulas for observables as a function of E will change and uh, therefore the relationship between the renormalized quantities E and observables will uh, be modified and this relationship will be fixed by choosing the renormalization scheme. So sometimes in some schemes the relationship between the renormalized parameters and observable might be very direct and in other schemes the relationship might be quite indirect. And so, uh, depending on that relationship, uh, of course, this also fixes and modifies the physical meaning and interpretation of your renormalized um, parameters and also the numerical values. Of 
E and so on. So that is the character of renormalization schemes. And uh, to, to jump to the conclusion, uh, just to give you an idea, of course, in the on-shell scheme, the uh, coupling constant uh, E means the physical charge of uh, the electron that you measure directly in experiments, and its numerical value corresponds to the fine structure constant 1 over 137. But in other schemes, the interpretation of E is different, and the numerical value is different as well. And so, uh, but that is the general, um, let's say, list of items that you should always be aware of when discussing renormalization schemes. And let us now focus on the on-shell scheme, which on the one hand, of course, cancels uh, ultraviolet divergences. But uh, how are the finite parts defined? They are defined such that uh, we absorb finite parts of selected green functions such that uh, all the loop corrections vanish. Vanish at least for on-shell momenta. That is the point. So we simply choose the finite part such that after renormalization, the loop corrections are zero. That is a very simple and a very nice choice. Of course, we cannot make all the loop corrections to everything zero, but for selected cases and for selected momenta, we can make it vanish. And that is the on-shell scheme. Now, in order to go on, ah, we do not have much time, but maybe we have enough time to make the following point, such that we in the afternoon can complete the on-shell scheme. Namely, I have told you already something about uh, the non-renormalization of the gauge fixing and uh, about the non-trivial structure of the counter term to the uh, gauge boson self-energy, which is transverse. And so in order to proceed and to actually even write down the on-shell conditions, we need to understand the counterpart that I already mentioned. So let us do that. Um, so there is a Ward or Slavnov-Taylor identity for the photon self-energy. And let me simply use the language of the uh, other lecture, which is the following. Namely, we can write down zero is equal to the Slavnov-Taylor identity expressed in this star notation, and then take a second functional derivative of this with respect to a ghost field and with respect to a photon field. So second functional derivative of this Slavnov-Taylor identity expression, and then we set all the fields to zero. And what we obtain in this way is simply the following, again, just using for the moment the notation of the other lecture, is this one. We get uh, that zero is equal to the product of two particular green functions, where this here is in our case in QED extremely trivial. That corresponds to the BRST transformation of uh, the photon, uh, which is a derivative of the ghost. And if we take a derivative with respect to the ghost, then the whole thing becomes proportional to the momentum p nu. And then, because it is proportional to the momentum p nu times a non-vanishing prefactor, we get p nu times that thing is 0. And that means that the photon two-point function is transverse. So therefore, we get p nu times gamma a mu a nu of p and minus p is uh, zero. And that is the one particle irreducible uh, two-point function, one pi, but complete for two photons 
a mu a nu. And by complete, I mean, first of all, three level plus one loop plus two loop plus all other orders and including all possible counter terms. So uh, whereas that was only one loop and with or without counter terms. So that is everything. And uh, that is fully transverse. And of course, a corollary of this is that our self energy P mu sigma mu nu with or without hat of P vanishes. And uh, for that reason, we can make an ansatz that our photon self energy after or before renormalization, sigma mu nu of Q must uh, be transverse. And so it must have the following form, minus i g mu nu Q square minus Q mu Q nu times a scalar function, which only depends on Q square. And uh, that scalar function is called gamma pi gamma of Q square. And that multiplies this transverse um, object in the front. And this pi gamma of Q square is called the vacuum polarization. So it is a very important object. And uh, as you see, so from this discussion, we see that the photon self energy is transverse and therefore it corresponds automatically to that structure that we have at our disposal from the counter term. And uh, the important quantity that eventually needs to be computed and discussed is this vacuum polarization, which is just a scalar with no open Lorentz indices. And then we simply see that after renormalization, we would obtain pi hat gamma which is pi without hat gamma plus delta ZA. So this is just the way that this field renormalization constant enters this discussion after we know this transversality of the photon self energy. So and then we have this simplification, which is the counterpart of the other identity. And we can now work with a um, vacuum polarization instead of the full self energy and then go through the renormalization procedure that we will do in the afternoon. Okay, so thank you very much and see you later.